uh, originally started ShmooCon was to have uh, better discourse around hard subjects, right? So we could sit around and talk about uh, the hard things that, that needed to get done. And at the time, one of the hard things that needed to get done was helping people organize and run uh, security conferences. And it was kind of, I mean, B-Sides was not a thing yet. There was a lot of uh, questions about, like, how do you run a conference and, and uh, how much does it cost and how do you, you know, organize it and all that kind of thing. And so we decided that we were going to have a talk every year where we go and go through the internals of how we run the conference. So all the financials, all the people, the rough spots, the good spots, all that kind of thing. Um, and then save it for possibility so that, um, A, as attendees, you can understand where your money went, how you spent your time here, how we spend our time trying to make things good for you and get feedback from you. But B, other people that want to run events can learn from us. Um, because things like, uh, how do you deal with the room commitments with the hotel and how many room commitments did you have and what happens if you don't make it are all big questions that kind of hang over people's heads when they try to run an event. Uh, and there's not a lot of good information sharing around that. So we try to be as transparent as we can around and all that information. And we do it totally leet style because that's a zero. It is, yes, totally, <laughs> totally leet. That's just me getting him to shut up. All right. <laughs> You can talk about this part too. Oh, geez, you should really—we should label the goddamn slides. Um, so we are not a nonprofit. Contrary to what a lot of people think, uh, they seem to think we're a nonprofit. Uh, nonprofits are complicated, and we don't like complicated things. Um, our general goal in life is to do as little work as possible, to have as much gain as possible. Um, and having an LLC where we just tell the feds at the end of the year, here's what we made, here's what we owe you, and we walk away is great. So we are an LLC incorporated in Maryland. Um, Almost everything we do is planned via phone and email. There's and, and Wicker these days. A lot of Wicker. A lot of Wicker. A lot of Wicker. Uh, but there's no formal like weekly or monthly meetings. There's no big committees that have to meet on a regular basis. There's no board. There's nothing like that. Um, it's all pretty <laughs> casual. Uh, it all happens uh, fairly organically and usually happens before the con. Um, <laughs> there. Are, there are uh, lists. We used to. We still run our own mailman server. Uh, we actually run our own mail server. Um, God help us. It's like one of the. It's now a nook, though. Um, like it, the old one died. And it was a big Dell, and now it's a little tiny nook. Um, but actually, we're using QuickList now because mailman's kind of a dog, and I think there's security vulnerabilities, and they're not even patching it anymore. So like, yay. We still use mailman. Yeah. Um, Sometimes. Yeah, not, I'm, I'm not hating on mailman. I, it's fine. I haven't gotten owned yet by it. Um, and then we, we just we start planning about now for next year, and then there's kind of a lull around the summertime, and as we come out of DEF CON is usually when Heidi kicks it into gear, <clears throat> and then once school starts for serious, that's when the real uh, planning starts, because that's when we have uh, more time to ourselves to get some work done. So staff, um, we talked about this at opening, but it's... Um you just don't do an event like this without an amazing, amazing group of people um, helping you uh, do everything. So from, um, I've got everything down there. I think I've got everything down there. We've got the speaker selection, registration, taping, streaming, AV, security labs, the Hack Fortress, the party folks, press. Again, not, not the press, but the people who help us select the press. Um, the uh, quote badge contest people. Uh, we've got one runner whose sole job is to make sure that we eat all weekend long. Yeah. And of course, our kids. I, am I missing anybody? But uh, one of the things that I really love about ShmooCon is that our um, our volunteers have come back year after year after year after year. I'm very. I mean, we have a very very small turnover, um, and it's usually just because babies or you know people get married or you know real true family events. And um, that I just love that. Um, it's my favorite thing. Yes. Yes, right as well. good. Okay, it forces on. me to be social with people. Humans are hard. So if you haven't guessed, we really have used these slides. I, they, we, we, uh, despite having used them for 13 years, we actually don't know what order they're in. So when we hit next slide, we're like, what, what, what's coming? Um, so I guess now we're going to talk about conference dates and venue because we are. What did we say about it? Um, we're going to, so we're, <laughs> uh, who, who was ever at the Marriott? We went through a lot of spaces at the Marriott, right? We were in the basement, and then we ended up in that brand new ballroom. Um, Do you remember when they put the new carpet in, and we all had like black fuzz at the bottom yeah, of like our it, jeans? Yeah, like the bottom of your pants long, were all fuzzy yeah. from the new carpet. That was fun, and then the snow, and then they hated us. 
Um, and then we were at the Hyatt for one year. This place has worked out really well for this size, I think. Uh, it works out well from a talk perspective. It works out well for the vendors because everyone's kind of forced to go past the vendors, so the vendors have a good experience. Uh, and then all the breakout rooms down the hallway uh, works out pretty well. So um, uh, we our dates, uh, actually, they float around a little bit, but we've been a lot more static the last four or five years. When we started, it'd be like March, February, January, March. You know, it kind of moved all around. Um, oh, well, a lot of that was due to my reluctance to not contract for more than one year because I never really knew if I wanted to come back and do this again. Um, but we decided that, you know, we all collectively liked it, and now we contract for two years at a time. So that so helps. These are the right dates for next year? They are absolutely the right dates. I double-checked, and it is actually back on Martin Luther King weekend for yeah. some reason. So that, the, the hotel um, uh, wants you to contract out far in advance, obviously, and we want to contract out not far in advance. So there's a lot of negotiation of like, hey, we'll do two years if you give us X, Y, and Z. Um, but the Hilton's been pretty um, uh, pretty good about uh, giving us some flexibility. So at least we got the next two years nailed down at this point. <clears throat> I guess now we're talking about the call for papers. <laughs> This makes I sense. Have no idea what I did here. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually, so we moved up all the prep parties this year for the conference, and so that almost all the prep took place the weekend before the conference. Whereas normally we're stuffing bags Wednesday night before we, before we come down, and that's that's been the tradition for a lot of years. But in moving things up, I actually created some time so I could work on things like these slides. But what's happened is I've totally forgotten what I wrote in these slides a week ago. So. And I kind of reorganized them while I was doing it, and that's that why we're sense. really destroyed. We'll just make it so. work. So the CFP uh, is open for two and a half months, something like that. Uh, and we had 211 submissions, which is down again a little bit. Yeah, by um, about 20, I yeah, think. Yeah, from, pa from past years. So our acceptance rate uh, went up because not only do we have fewer talks uh, come in, but we actually have more talks this year because of the 20-minute slots uh, on Saturday. So we ended up with more talks in general that we had to accept. So I think in the past years, it's been around 14% acceptance, and this year, we're, um, you know, over 19% acceptance. Uh, you see the breakdown on, on tracks and um, uh, gender distribution. Um, the gender is, I mean, it's truly a best guess. Um, if anything, we um, fail on the, um, I don't, I don't want to call it the right side of that, but the female vote might be higher than, than what is said there just because it's just, it's just a guess. Yeah, we don't go research each person. It's just kind of look at the name and try to make an make a educated decision. So, um, and, and this is something I think we've seen more and more conferences do, start to uh, speak about uh, uh, the distribution on topic and gender for their CFPs. And I think it's important um, that as many conferences as can do this so we start to understand um, you know, uh, what's working and what's not. We actually ran our CFP this year through... Um, so I don't remember the name I can't of this, remember the, name of it. the God software, damn it. It's but a, it uh, checks your text for, um, I don't know how to say gen, it, gender friendliness. Yeah, gender bias. Um, and so like it was designed for like resumes. Um, so when you, or not resumes, but uh, job descriptions. So when you write a job description, it'll help you tailor your job description toward um, the people that you're trying to attract. And <clears throat> excuse me, we ran the CFP through that same thing. And it got a little angry because like we didn't have a specific description about the job because <laughs> it wasn't actually a job description. But it did help us recognize where we had heavily uh, male or female uh, kind of phrasing and bias within our CFP. Um, and we tried to bring it into a place where it was kind of appealing to, to everyone. So um, it was an interesting exercise, and we actually weren't that far away from where we wanted to be, uh, but it's something that we'll continue to do going forward to make sure that our language isn't biasing away from uh, appealing to everybody in the community. Todd, are you in here? No. No, okay. Um, sorry. No, it's okay. I'll deal with it. We were going to kick him out. Yeah. So... Um, we did you I was dealing did you talk about the talks submitted per track? I mean, there's numbers there. I okay. didn't say anything. It's just it you know, math. those are a little misleading because people submit to more than one track and of course with the twenty minute talks they were if they were submitted to bring it on, they just submitted to both and told us how they would um, change that. But it kinda shows you where the talks were leading if you look at the overall numbers. Some people just went full elf in the elevator and just like <laughs> rattle them all off. Um, no, no elf fans. Buddy the elf, the Empire State Building elevator. Yeah, thanks. Okay, good. All right. It looks it's like not it just a Christmas movie. Great. You can watch it any time. Okay, it's a good. It's a good movie. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm not judging you much. All right. Um, 40, uh, 40 of this year's speakers were first timers. Forty two actually were first time speakers at ShmooCon. Um, 
Yeah, those numbers are correct. I'm like, did I change these? Uh, 18 have been on our stages before, some of them multiple times. I think the person or the people that still hold... David, where are you? Okay, I, you are right behind the light, dude. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Sergey Bratis is still one of the one of the guys who's appeared on our stage the most, but he's tied now with two others, and I can't... One of them's got to be Osman now. Oh, it is. It is Mike Osman, yeah. Yeah. So, and they've been on our stages like six or seven times total, I think, over the years. Yeah. Um, but I get real excited that, uh, you know, we do have such a large number of new to ShmooCon speakers every year, and certainly the uh, the people who are, you know, total noobs to speaking in general, I don't, that number's not even entirely accurate, because when they're speaking with somebody else, it doesn't always convey in... Um, the information that they pass in the CFP. So I'll hear it when, once they get here, and they're like, yeah, my friend's really excited. He's never done anything like this before. And so that number starts to kind of go up as, as we go through the con. So I just, I mean, this one, again, everything's my favorite about ShmooCon. But I'm, I am curious what, uh, it's really not. You seem so full of energy, I can tell. <laughs> Listen, one of us stayed up to deal with the party last night, and yeah. it was not you. I had to entertain, and I fell asleep on the couch. There's like so, 20 people in our room, I'm like, Right. And my seven-year-old son's like, Dad, wake up. There's people here. Dad, <laughs> let me sleep. Right. Meanwhile, Heidi's phone blows up. Um, so my question to all of you is, what other stats would you guys like to see about Call for Papers? Is there anything that we are not presenting that would be of interest? Yes, ma'am. Um, something about which speakers have been here the most times. Yeah, so we have that. Um, I, could, I could certainly, again, David's sitting behind the light, and I'm staring directly at it. But um, David so kindly has um, actually, because he's a weird statistician like that, um, has been tracking that already. So whenever I have questions like that, I just ask him. So, yes, sir. How about geographic correlations? That's interesting. I've never asked that. I, we could. We could. Sure. I mean, we certainly, I can tell you sort of anecdotally that they come from all over. Um, yeah. It's just like Pacific Northwest, the South, whatever, yeah. Sure. I do I do feel like we're pretty diverse, just knowing what I know, but Yeah, no, I mean it's an interesting point. I, I think that um the idea of uh, especially uh, expansion of tech jobs throughout the country is important right now. Um, and like, like right now, I'm frankly really pissed off about the Amazon uh, headquarters search because like, A, first of all, there doesn't need to be three areas in the D.C. area selected for the finalists. Like, we don't fucking need more traffic. Like, go pound sand. West um, Virginia. <laughs> But also, like, there's huge parts of the country that have a labor force that are willing to be retrained to be productive parts of this, right? And, like, Amazon should be looking at Ohio or Missouri or West Virginia and go invest money in the central part of the country where everybody is. Um, yeah. This is part of my run for Congress, by the way. Um, All right. So, did, you, did you have a, a – go ahead. Red Hat. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's not in these slides, but I do an end of the year sort of call for papers post on the website. And I do put not all keywords, but I do put kind of a smattering of keywords there. Um, I can hone those a little bit more and do more of that. But yeah, so we sort of do that, but I can, I can do more of that. Yeah. So again, I do some of that. Um, but I can, I can certainly do more. And that's in the post. It's not in these slides, but it is in the post that we do annually. Yes, sir? How about, like, those talks have been presented here for, like, the first time? Um, most of them. That is one of our tenets of our call for papers. We very rarely accept talks that have been given before unless we feel that they're important information to be shared or they have substantial updates, so therefore usually making them a different talk. So not all, but certainly a high, high percentage. Yes, sir? <laughs> um, okay, so we have effectively, I'm assuming you guys, this is a pretty small room. Do I need to be repeating? Yes. Or Okay, so he's asking about when the timeline of um, when the submissions come in. So we effectively have two deadlines in our CFP process, and one is, um, we call it the early bird. Only like four people get accepted during that. It's just kind of our bait, you know, for the rest of the conference. So um, we had about, and this is true for every year, by the time the early bird deadline comes, it's usually about 70 talks. 
it's le usually less than 100, but you know, 70 to, to 100 talks have been submitted. We get to, I don't know, we usually close down around like November 19th, and like November 18th, that night, I am like up at, you know, 12.01, waiting for those last talks to come in, and they roll in. That whole day is like fast and furious. We probably get another 60 talks on the very last day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. So if you procrastinated, don't feel bad. Many others did as well. And it really doesn't affect, like, if you get selected or not, because I will tell you that most of the committee just waits until they're, you yeah. know, they're in. Yes, Alanka. Yeah, so again, back, back to the keywords. We do have that information, again, thanks to Frank, who I don't know if he's in the room, but you guys are all weird. They all have this stuff, and I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if they're like, I've got it. You know, I've got it, and they, like, send it to me, and it's right there. So. There, um, there's Todd. Hi, Todd. Todd, could you come here for a second? <laughs> That's Todd. Todd will ferry chicken wings across the country on an airplane if you ask nicely. They're very, very special chicken Ch very wings. Very good chicken wings. It yeah. pisses off an entire plane. Only slightly less than, say, a tuna salad sandwich will piss off an entire plane. No, I'm, so. Caribbean jerk's amazing, man. What? Everybody it, loves the way Everyone it loves Caribbean jerk chicken. <laughs> um, That's a bold statement. If you anyway, ever not had the like opportunity to eat at Mango Cafe in San Jose, they have the Palo best. Alto. Oh, yeah, sorry, Palo Alto. See, I don't even know. I haven't been there in 15 years. Best Caribbean we jerk chicken wings. Okay. <laughs> how to hack she selection. Was I was being me. him. What, what is up with that? Um, how to hack selection. So, you know, everybody and their brother and sister wants to do a talk on how to submit a talk, right? And here is my contention. If you read the CFP, you will have all the answers that you need on how to submit a successful submission especially in regards to our call for papers. The answers are in there, I promise you. Um, and this is true at, at any con. I mean, if you talk to Nikita at DEF CON, you talk to Dave at Derby, like the amount of times that they're just like enraged about like follow the fucking directions, you know? And, and it, it really um, makes it pretty hard for the program committee to accept a talk when they see that you didn't follow directions because then they lose belief instantly that you know what you're going to talk about and you have any credibility. Because if you can't actually follow a simple step-by-step, -step, like step one, here's the title, step two, the author, Well, all it's that organizational kind of too because when we, uh. you know, we're going through the process and we have to go back and collect that particular information, it's so much easier if we know what we're looking at. You know, we're looking for the third bullet point. We're looking for whatever. And if that's out of order or it's missing, like that's the, oh, that's the worst. If it's missing and I have to like email you and get it. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, usually I'm just not emailing you because we flag it as an incomplete submission and it just doesn't make the, the cut usually. So following directions is the number one thing you can do for any submission you make anywhere. There's really nothing more to say beyond that, but but the things I wrote there. Yeah, I, the, the uh, explaining your ideas of why they're important, um, I've actually seen some really, it, we've had these discussions on the program committee where somebody will submit something and one of the program committee will see like why it's important. Like, they, wow, this is really cool. And you'll see in their notes like why, it, but the rest of the program committee couldn't wrap their head around it. And the person who submitted just submitted like the facts, if you will, not why you should care about it. Um, and then the program committee has to kind of go and huddle and be like, oops, maybe we didn't think about this correctly. They go back and, you know, they, they re-rate and the talk ends up making the cut or whatever. But that why you should care bit is important because the, the program committees, programs committees are diverse. It doesn't matter what conference you submit to. And some people are going to be experts in forensics and some people are going to be experts in policy and some people are going to be experts in whatever. And they may not be an expert in the area of the thing that you submitted. So you have to help them understand. Like, you may not be an expert, but here's the salient bits of what matter. That goes a long way to helping the PC evaluate both up and down the, the correctness of your talk for, for this conference. But just to add, so, and again, this is in that big CFP post that's up on the website, but the way that we do talks is, yes, you submit through a, um, it's OpenConf, is the open source software that we use, and uh, we have a selection committee, and they do grade the talks, so you get a score, if you will, but it's not just score, it is, we look at the scores, but then it's balancing the tracks, it's also looking for those first-time speakers, again, that's one thing that we do um, aggressively, it's looking for new content, so just, you may have a high score, but you might not get selected because... Maybe there were two talks of similar ilk or, you know, it, it, just a whole balancing act. And it takes a couple days. Yeah. Right? 
You can just read that one. Okay, good. Ooh, boy. This is my favorite subject. The good news is you all got tickets, so you're not angry about it. Hi, everybody at home. We love you. So, um, every... I mean, More. We, we've done this, um, uh, obviously, for a long time. It's gotten, the ticket sales technical pr process has gotten pretty smooth. You know, I think we got it, we got it reasonably uh, uh, down. What happens is, invariably, we get a lot of questions, especially for people that don't get ticket sales. Like, why don't you change it? Like, why don't you do it differently? So, um, first of all, we are the size of we are. That's uh, the next slide. Uh, that's the next yeah. slide. Okay, but I won't get into that. I think. The, Every year we get people that I have an idea on how you should do ticket sales. Cool. What is it? Um, and and no inevitably, one, it's you should do a lottery. It's you should do a lottery. And I say, cool. How do we do the lottery? Is it by email address? Because I can make more email addresses than you. Is it by I have to buy a dollar ticket with a unique credit card? Because that biases toward people with credit cards and lots of credit cards and people who've been around a long time and college students don't like that and people that just started out don't like that. Do I ask for like pictures of your government issued ID? That sounds like shit that I don't want to have. You know. Um, Plus, we're, we're pretty tied to our model of you know mostly anonymity. But yeah, I mean, we don't really want to know who you are. We just want to sell you a ticket. Like that like, guy. I don't, I don't yeah, there's a few in here we want to know. Um, but um, it's really hard to have a lottery that's fair, uh, right? Because you bias toward people with money, you bias toward people with time. It's not like a race. I mean, who's going to run the New York Marathon twice at the same time, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? I mean, like right. if I mean, you stuff the that? yeah, if you stuff the ballot box or whatever on a, on a system like that, you're not. That doesn't matter. But for for uh, you, Tom. Tom might Tom might run a marathon twice. Um, so I mean, we struggled, and we've looked at a lot of different things. And people give us um, uh, uh, ideas all the time, and 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 by and large, we thought about them all, um, and we'll engage them with them and talk through like here's why this won't work and that won't work. Um, our goal is to have a fair system that allows for a diverse group of people to show up, so that college students and people working in government agencies and uh, people that are you know senior in their careers all have the same chance of getting the ticket. Um, and there's I know there's lots of conceptions that we hold tickets back and we give them to our friends and whatever. It's bullshit. It would be harder to make a system system that was biased, right? That I would be like, I want people from NSA to come more than other people, and then I have to go find the NSA freaking proxy, and then <laughs> run through a firewall and get a bunch of other shit. Um, and, and I tell you, we do get people at work in intelligence communities on their unclassified you know, networks getting tickets. We get people roaming around the subway in New York on their phone getting tickets. We get people in overseas countries getting tickets. I mean, it's scattered all over the place, um, and it's way easier to do a fair ticket process than an unfair ticket process, as it turns out. Woohoo! Woo Good job. Also, thank you. <laughs> um, so the cart uh, again. We haven't had the shenanigans of the server crashing and like flailing around and kicking us in the teeth that we had in past years. That's been pretty stable. No, our last um, uh, flailing was due to um, whoever it was not believing us when we told them what would happen. On yeah, when, when our, our hosted no, WordPress no, no, provider. No, 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 you'll be fine. Like, we will not get any traffic for 10 months, <clears throat> and then one day we're going to get, I don't know, on the average of 2,000 page uh, requests a second for about 10 minutes. Is that like, okay? We can totally handle that. <clears throat> Here, I'll, they, I'll sanitize that. Yeah, thanks. They, uh, they crashed 10 minutes uh, beforehand. Like, we've never seen this. Also, when I, I crowdsourced a load test on Twitter, they're like, we've never seen anyone crowdsource a load test on Twitter. Who crowdsourced a load test on Twitter? You, 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 you did, You don't dear. even have Twitter creds. <laughs> oh, my God. You think I did I was on the Twitter phone creds? with them. Um, yeah, but I'm just saying. So um, there's the stats. Um, it's, um, we, we dig through. So one of the things that we do that you, you obviously know is that when you – um, go to get a ticket, you get a reservation ID, and then you go pay later. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons for that is uh, we spend time in between there uh, looking at all the transactions, looking for shenanigans, looking for bots, looking for people cheating and that kind of thing. What um, credit card processors hate is huge amounts of refunds, especially from an organization like us that we only do two or three days of business with a credit card processing company. Yeah, we had the same merchant account for years, and it was like two years ago. I'm like getting spinning things up. And it, nothing's working, and I got no notification, mind you. So I call them up, and they're like, yeah, we just won't handle your type of business anymore. And never, I, never mind that it had been a good client for, I don't know, eight years at that point. 
but yeah, they they just stopped doing. They were events. just done with us. So, um, um, because um, events have a large number of uh, refunds, and that starts to speak to fraud and other things, so they have to investigate. So it's a very expensive process. So we don't release the tickets for purchase until we verify that we think it was a legitimate sales round. If there have been shenanigans, we deal with the shenanigans, take those tickets out of rotation, whatever it is, and then we release them for you to pay. So um, the, 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 it served two purposes. Originally, we did that because when the server was bouncing up and down, people were paying and like they were getting like no response code and they didn't know if they'd actually paid because the server was all messed up. Um, but once we got that fixed, we kept that distance because it allows us to make sure that we don't have to go back to our credit card processors and be like, can you refund 400 tickets for us? Because they would just um, shut us down. I think one year we really should record <laughs> the, what it looks like when we are sitting at home, like getting ready to run sales. We're on the phone with David and um, it's a lot of silence until it's not a lot of silence. <laughs> And then it's like, are we sold out? Are we sold out? We've got to be sold out. Like, I've already said the word sold out, so we're sold out, right? <laughs> yeah. And the go live is, is um, manual still. Like, we don't, we had crowded it up for a while years ago, but when the servers were bouncing up and down, like, you, we couldn't, the box is so busy, you couldn't even get on and kill Cron. Um, and I mean, like, seriously, like, when you type W and five minutes later it says the load is 8,000, you're like, well, we're fucked. Um, <laughs> Or, or your machine logs you out. Yeah, you know, or yeah, yeah she, she got logged yeah. out and things like that. So it, now it's I'm I'm actually on the box and I've got a script and I'm like on this website and I'm like okay twelve now okay and it will be plus or minus a second because I'm actually hitting enter. Um, so it is not automatic. And if, they, if things are sideways, that way we can just not go live, right? That's the whole goal. Is if there's anything gone wrong, we just don't pull so, the trigger. But the big thing that you know people always say is that you know Shmukon's the botcon, right? So um, yeah, we see some of that and we make changes to combat some of. That and we learn things with every new round. So what worked last time probably won't work next time, um, we hope. Anything else to say about that, Mr. Potter? Nope. All right. Glad Moving you're right me, along. Though. Maybe. What? I did something. There you go. Stupid bot. Um, now you can talk about size. You were trying to do that Okay, earlier, thank you. Yes, and, okay. Um, I just was saving Don't let me you. get off the rails. That would be unfortunate. Um, <laughs> so, A, we want to preserve the, the feel of the con, right? Like, this is an interesting size because you can meet a lot of new people, but you can also see people that you know. You can easily get from one end of the con to another. Um, like, at DEF CON, getting from one end of the con to another is like, a, a, you need a Sherpa, you have to plan ahead and be hydrated, uh, you know, and you walk. I actually had... a map, and just in case you get lost. Dalton on is in the back. He's one of our staff members. He used to work for me until I fired him. And... Um, that's and not why? True. That's not true. Um, he he quit. Um, also, he's a quitter. He was at DEF CON, <laughs> and we were uh, um, Logan and I and a bunch of other people that, that worked with us were were working Hack Fortress one year way off, and this is at the the Bally's in Paris, you know, sh crazy thing where it was across two two places. So we're over in the contest area. Um, I see Dalton on Saturday, and his eyes are like this big. I'm like, what's going on? He's like. I didn't realize this part of DEF CON existed. He had been over, like, in the talks over in Paris, like, for the whole day of Friday, and, like, Saturday went off on, like, a, a constitutional and realized, like, DEF CON just went on forever. Like, it went all the way up to North Las Vegas and up to Henderson. I mean, it was like, he was, he was stunned. I'm like, man, if you're in a conference so big that by day two, there's still people like, holy shit, where does it end? Um, that's kind of not what we're gunning for. Right. So. Well, and that's part of why I'm hesitant to leave this space, because at 2,200 people, we can keep you all on the con floor. You don't have to go up you know, the flight of stairs and around the corner to find this track room. Um, I like keeping you all down here. We think that um, it works. It makes it easier for us as a staff. Um, yeah, and, and honestly. And it preserves that feel, that atmosphere. Yeah. Absolutely, and and we run this out of our house. Like this is the family business around the holidays, uh, and the house gets full of boxes, and the garage gets full of boxes. We just sometimes shove the boxes under the tree, so it looks like you the kids festive. are getting a lot. Put a bow on it. You know, there's so much disappointment on Christmas Day. <laughs> I got schmoo balls again. <laughs> right. Uh, what, what are these? Hand sanitizer? Yeah. Like what's that? The um, and then at the we they have a. a really a con in a, in a truck, right? At the end of all of this, when we get everything ready and the bags are all stuffed, it all gets shoved into a giant truck. Um, and a 26 foot truck is about as big as we can get in our driveway. Um, this year, um, I had fun with the truck. Uh, I was taking it to storage. And, so, uh, so can, can I, <laughs> let me just say, when, when I rent the truck, it has all these check boxes down at the bottom for you know the things you can get, and I check them all. I got to use them this time. <laughs> uh, lost damage waiver was well exercised. Um, in our driveway, we got these two big stone 
wall things that because of the historic district that we live in, we really can't get rid of them, and they just sit there and make it hard for big trucks to get in and out. Um, so I was fading we are away the left. Only people in our neighborhood. And I'm looking problem. at the stone, and and Bot was there helping me, and we're all looking at the stone, and I'm cruising down the driveway, and all of a sudden there's just this bam, and branches and plastic all go flying out in front of me. I'm like, oh, I hit a tree. Like I, <laughs> I ventilated the truck. Uh, there was a big ass hole in that and everything. There's plastic everywhere, and. My goal was to glue it back together, um, <laughs> and so I gave it to my son. I'm like, here's the truck. Can you put it well, together? And they're like, I'm going to go get too, duct tape, right? and they just climbed up on the truck, and we returned the truck covered in duct tape. So, not, uh, To be fair, not the first time we've returned a rental in bad condition. No. Although last time it wasn't our fault. No, but, but yeah, that was, I, was, I was actually giggling, because I knew the LDW would cover it. They're like, ah, I put a hole in the truck. It was very exciting. Yeah, but you told me about it right away and not 10 years later, so that was That's nice. good. Yeah. That, that is a reference to the time Shu and I called poison control on our, our, our uh, oldest son and didn't tell Heidi for 10 years. So he's still alive. He's right there. That was a funny When he moment. ate the A&D ointment, they just said he'll run a little loose for a day. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I believe in the same two hours, he also poured beer all over Oh, yeah, yeah. Heidi so walked I had out, been gone. Heidi I mean, walked I out like, the door yeah. and Tara just walked over to the freaking table and grabbed a beer. It was like, foop, and just poured it on his head. I'm like, it's on. Because... Um, because in Alaska, when you watch football on a Sunday, it starts at 9 a.m. Because it's Alaska, so like at 8:30, we're like popping beers. So Heidi's going to work, and Shmoo and I are like, "Time no, to get No, I was drunk. leaving town. It like, was my first business trip without you know anything. Yeah, like, no. So your son got hammered. It was great. Yeah, was yeah. We should keep. Okay. Keep going. Um, attendees, we have those. You're you are them. You are they. Yay. Yeah. Something. Um, yeah, so uh, you can read that. We have several categories of attendees, um, sponsors, events folks, schmoozers, students. Huge turnout of students this year. I, I love that. Um, roughly 85 staff, 67 speakers, and I counted this morning and then forgot, but it is somewhere around 14 press. Cool. Which we put, I mean, we actually have a pretty hard limit on press and or press. Do you have a press slide? What? Do you have a press slide? No. Oh, so um, uh, Is he waiting for like Space permission? Rogue uh, wrangles the uh, press people for us. Uh, for those who don't know, Space Rogue. Space Rogue's been involved in like calling shenanigans on press and infosec for it's the better part Space of twenty Rogue years. And Chris John Riley. Oh know. yeah, CJG. he doesn't know these things. Yeah. So. Well, Jesus. Anyway, our general philosophy, which I think I do know, um, is to not let all the press in uh, because that we would have an awful lot of press come in. We try to have a good diversity of press, but not have like 50 press people all running around with camera crews and all kinds of shit. So uh, Chris and Space Rogue spend a lot of time figuring out who the press are, what they cover, what the right to, you know, kind of coverage and diversity is that we're looking for, and then let some in. And we've actually had some press get pretty indignant, like, the fuck do you mean I can't come to your con? It's like, well, we said no. So you can't or come they to the apply, con. and then they are like, "Okay, but I'm going to bring my video camera crew," and we're like, "No, no, you're, you're not. not. Not bringing that." So right. So um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. All right. As of about what was this, Matt? Like 40 minutes ago, this was our checked-in number. Um, so we are only down. I guess that says 68 people who have not checked in. I suspect that's actually a little bit lower because um, we were still getting a trickle this morning. Um, I've got the numbers there from the previous year. Some of them look like there's bigger deltas there, and that's because we have commonly done this talk on Saturday afternoon. So if you, the number's like well over 100, that's why. Um, in some years I went back and fixed it at the end of the con, in some years I didn't. But you can kind of see we have a pretty good hit rate when it comes to redeeming tickets. Now some of those, it's true, um, might be folks grabbing, you know, they've got four tickets, they just grab all four. We don't know if there's actually people in attendance. But judging by what we're seeing, um, and from what Redstaff was telling me, you were actually mostly seeing people correlating to um, badges this year. Yes. So um, I think that's great. I think that's so An awesome. Percentage. It is. I mean, we're we're in like what three percent, two and a half percent space at that point that aren't aren't making it. Um, and it's not. So if you look at B sides, and I don't mean to speak out of turn for for the B sides folks, but when you run a free conference, like the motivation, you know, the the punishment for not showing up is that you don't get your free money back. Um, well, you know, but that's part of why B sides actually started charging at least yeah, nominally a little a bit. So there was a little bit of pain if you didn't right? if you didn't show up. So it's not like 150 bucks is a bunch, but it's enough. 
Um, so between the fact that I think we run a pretty good event and people want to be here, and the fact that it's there's a fair bit of... It's just about the swag. Yeah, and, and the swag um, and the party, I think that we get a, a pretty high uptake. Um, you know, I don't know what more expensive, like what the hit rate is for like blackout, like when they charge $2,500, how many people don't show up? Um, you know, is there a material difference between us and them? I have no idea. But 2.5% seems like a pretty pretty small number. It's always It's nice to see that. Yeah, you look okay. We can just keep going. Okay. I was mathing. Math. Um, all right, vendors and sponsors, which effectively are the same thing for us. We, I don't know. We know why that says both, but um, like I said, these slides are very old. Uh, we have 51 sponsors this year. That's including our lab sponsors, which are handled slightly differently than our mainline sponsors. Um, we have de we have four different levels of sponsorship. Um, bronze, which is reserved for. Companies that are within their first three years of business, and it's pretty stinking cheap for them to be here. And then um, <laughs> silver, gold, and platinum. And they get various you know, amounts of tickets and different placement and stuff like that. But, and then we have a no-table sponsorship, so you can sponsor the con. You're not out there, but you get your people here, and you can put something in the bag. Uh, one of the things that we like to do is really push our sponsors to be a part of the experience here. Uh, so, you know, other cons you see two people standing behind a table with some slick sheets, and it's really exciting to go talk to them. Um, almost everybody that comes here runs some kind of contest, has something fun on a, I mean, at least something that moves. Um, I don't know. Things that don't move aren't fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's my takeaway from that. Sometimes I um, <laughs> say smart things. All right, anyway, so moving on. I don't know why this is here, but here it is. Man, you're so critical of your own slides. Um, oh, I'm so asleep. We don't. Con I mean, obviously, you can give your tickets away to whoever you want. We don't, it, which is weird. Uh, we get people like who will write in and be like, "I can't make it. Can I transfer this ticket to my friend, and they can people come like, with?" Sure. Like, sure. Step one, print it out. Step two, hand it to your friend. Step three, wait till he says thank you. And if he doesn't take it back, right? Like, <laughs> manners are important. So. Um, that's weird for people, especially if you've been to like corporate cons or big events where like all the trade show people are scanning your badges and whatever. Like you're supposed to be who you're supposed to be. We don't give a shit. Um, we've also uh, discouraged. And I think as a community at large, people are discouraging. Oh, I think like, this is huge. Uh, you know, don't don't make money on secondhand sales. Like don't buy tickets and sell them on eBay for $800. Um, there's been a lot of like seller shaming around that, where people will call people out for, hey, you're an asshole unless you take all that extra money and give it to charity. Like that's the okay use case. And beyond that, it's not. Yeah, you know. this, um, that, that used to kind of plague us, but I, we just, the push from all of you to push for at-cost sales has been phenomenal, and I think it's self-correcting. It's, been, it's yeah. been pretty impressive to us. Um, we do have a wait list every year uh, that I maintain, um, just kind of, it's not real, real advertised, but I have a big long list of people who are waiting for tickets. So if you ever do find that you have extra tickets, um, you can let me know and I'll put you in contact with someone who wants to purchase one. The only, my only requirements are that it's at cost. But if you go through me, the advantage is I will invalidate the seller's ticket and issue a new ticket to the buyer to provide a level of protection there that you won't get through other means. The other, but the problem is, is I have no guarantees if tickets will pop or not, but there you go. So, and anyone get in on a miracle ticket from the lobby? Like, did anyone just sit in the lobby and wait for a ticket to materialize here? Um, I heard a few people. I talked to a guy. He's like, I've been here for five years, and all I ever do is sit in the lobby and wait for somebody to have a spare ticket, and I buy it off him. Does um, he do, like, like, the color of the envelope thing and hold it? Above yeah, I mean, just, it's, it's, I mean, for the deadheads, right? You just, I need a miracle, and someone hooks you up, uh, or you get really stoned. And, um, um, and, and even talking with uh, Lauren earlier today, she was saying she had a bunch of people that couldn't make it in, but they're locals. They rolled up, they got tickets in the lobby, and they came in. So, like, the secondary wait list is, like, sit at the bar and, you know, wait for the miracle, and you'll end up down here. If you don't know what a miracle ticket is, I recommend going and watching a Grateful Dead documentary sometime. It's, it'll be instructive. Um, actually, before we get to this real quick, I don't know if any of you noticed, but West Point is sort of here, not here this year. The cadets didn't make it, right? But I, I was just so impressed. Uh, our West Point representative back there came up to me and said, look, the cadets didn't make it, but here's what we did. And they distributed the, all the tickets that we typically get for West Point every year to soldiers in this area, active duty soldiers, yes. And so they were able to come to the con in their stead. So. The, uh, the poor cadets got called up for inspection, and so there are a lot of disappointed kids up in New York. So I don't sorry. know if you've ever been to Highland Falls, We're New York. It. We're almost done. It's, um, it's not the most metropolitan place in the world. <laughs> yeah, they have McDonald's, and there's a couple other like restaurants. It. 
And and for for kids that grew up somewhere warmer and more metropolitan, it is crazy. It it feels like they're off in the wilderness, like with Thoreau or something like that, right? Um, and when you're like a first or second year and you get to go off post and come to DC and wear civilian clothes, it doesn't matter why, right? Like they don't care if it's a security cops, right? They're like, I'm off post, I'm wearing jeans, man. So not only do they not get to come to Shmoocon, they didn't actually get to get off post, which I as as I feel bad about, but um, hopefully you know next year. Uh, things work out better. So, all right. So, in money in, um, we only make money in exactly two ways: through sponsorship and ticket sales. So, those numbers are actually pretty accurate. I think they're rounded to some degree, obviously. But so, our total funds generated this year were around four hundred thirty thousand dollars. Sounds like a lot. It's not. This is the most detailed I have ever done the out money out slides, and I don't even remember where in money in or out money out. That was a typo <laughs> that I had on the web page once that Beetle didn't let me live down. So um, is that what it was? Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. I said in money in, and he just went in money in, baby. Like he just ran around yelling it. And ever since then, it's been. So been this a thing. is a pretty um, comprehensive breakdown of how we spend our money. Um, in years previous, I've just kind of done the high level categories. This year, I broke them down a bit more for you. Um, I'll let you look at it for a second, but if you have any questions about it, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, this, yeah, will, this will all get posted later. Yeah. Yes, sir. So a lot of our, I mean, obviously we've, we own projectors. These are all our own projectors, and most of them were purchased several years ago. This year we did add two more, you know, newbies to our projector family. So there is some gear attrition over the years. We, so this year we bought six new laptops because of the changes that we made in, um, I'm sorry, he asked about uh, numbers and changes and... Yeah, is there spiky? Is like there spiking? Like so, so I would say that they're like our like gear costs are probably you know we'll have a, we had a high gear cost this year. Next year, we won't unless something you know egregious breaks. This year with the badges, we had a huge spike in badge cost. Obviously, that that'll go way down next year. Um, <laughs> next year you're getting, getting post-it notes, <laughs> assholes. Like it's just gonna be. <laughs> A lot, a lot of the costs are relatively static. Like the, the um, what I spend on attendee swag tends to sort of remain in the same ballpark. It's just how I spend it. You might get two or three items this year. Those floaty pens. I was so excited. I hope you liked them. Um, cost a little bit more than normal, so I just didn't. You know, I did one less item, a Schmoocon branded item. In the they didn't bag. blow up in the cold, did they? Like I was the, so scared of that. Did anyone get a pen up. that wasn't a floaty pen because it blew up in the cold? It sat outside our house for like four days the other day, and we were like, huh, I wonder if that's water or something else. <laughs> like and I'm, I'm guessing it's now something else. <laughs> um, DEF CON, we bring Hack Fortress to DEF CON every year. So part of that is shipping costs and then just um, supportive costs there. Um, there was a question back here I thought I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Rick. The per per unit cost. So it was um, per unit cost on this year's badge. So twenty three fifty badges at four th forty thousand dollars, roughly. Yeah, I'm on it. Hold he's, on. He's using the calculators. I can't. I don't know which way to divide. The other way. That's right. Eight thousand dollars per badge. <laughs> It, it was it was roughly about fifteen dollars. I didn't even have to let him do that. I already knew the answer. Yeah, it was like fifteen bucks a bag. Yeah. It was not cheap. They were really. So when we when we got the quote, we had like all these grandiose ideas, and and they <laughs> said, okay, cool, we'll call you back. And we're like driving from New York, so we're in and out of cell service, and the call comes through, so we're pulled over on the side of the road, and and you know taking this call over our Bluetooth car, and it's not it's not a good we're connection. A, we're in a we're a GMC three quarter ton pickup truck doing seventy miles an hour. <laughs> It was so bad. Terrible. So, so, so they're like, they're like, yeah, we can totally do that. And um, you know, how does a hundred thousand dollars sound to you? And I said, well, that doesn't sound very good at all. Let me call you back. So very sheepishly, but you know, once we continued to drive and got into actually decent cell service, we called them back, and they're like, yeah, we kind of still want all those things, but can you do it for forty thousand dollars instead? So instead of having like Please? onboard onboard lipo batteries that get recharged by USB, you get big honking double A's off the back and things like that. So those are the kind of trade offs that we made um, in that in that space. So but they um, um, they were a great company to work with. They and they pulled it off. So. Um, would definitely recommend. Only two caught fire. <laughs> and well, only one of them was on an attendee when it did it. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Winning. That much better than the year we did the um, steel cut yourself. Yeah, the serrated, the serrated steel <laughs> ones. We handed out That's knives. That's a great badge. It's also a weapon. I don't know if you noticed, but your shirt's all tore up. Like Not TSA approved. Really um, any other questions? We have five minutes. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so there is, I don't even know this year if there's money left over, to be honest. We've, I, anyway, um, there's a lot less money left over this year because of the badge cost and then some other uh, last minute expenses for things like replacing the badges and um, some gear. We had some broken gear that we had to replace last minute. The surface died. Yeah. The surface died and the battery is, is, won't charge because it, it needs was, a firmware um, update, but the firmware update won't apply itself unless the battery is fully charged. And it was three days past warranty, so that was beautiful. Fuck you, Microsoft. Yeah. Well, I really, I really think that we should just open boxes earlier and test things. It was it's like three, three, three days, days out, out of warranty. warranty. It was like um, January 10th. We discovered it. it was like, when we, did we buy it? We'd January gone to 7th last year. Even Fuck. Earlier, we might have been in good shape there, but you know, whatever. Um, God. So, big question: What else do you want to see in Own the Con? We literally, again, have used these slides for years and years and years. So, if I need to change them, please tell me. Yes. I'm sorry. Charity statistics. Charity statistics. We will do that at um, closing. Closing, but I will tell you every year we do bags of crap. It, it's the, the response is phenomenal. The numbers are big this year. Matt just left, but I mean it's it's total. Yeah, so fifteen, sixteen thousand total across the three charities. Yes, ma'am. It's cool. Oh, yes. She was a student. Um. Yes, so we had, uh, I opened that sometime in, um, I don't know, November-ish, and the idea there is that a, uh, a con attendee can pay a higher price, they purchase a ticket for themselves, a ticket for a student, and also contribute $100 towards a stipend for the student, Shmukon then throws in another $100, and uh, you know students get to come. There's no one-on-one -on -one correlation, it's just a big pool of people. So this year, um, we had lots of schmoozer student applications come in early, and I shut it down because at that time, I didn't actually have any student applications coming in, so I was getting a little nervous. 38 schmoozers were accepted. In the end, I accepted every complete student application that we had by the deadline, and it was 83 students. So a huge amount of that came out of Schmoocon's pocket, but thank you to our schmoozers as well for offsetting that. Um, bringing students here is a pretty big deal to us. Uh, there, are, there are typically a lot, and I'm sure you've noticed a lot of college students at, um, at ShmooCon. I will tell you um, that I will be putting uh, more boundaries around the Shmooza student program next year just to contain it. It keeps getting bigger, and so there's a concern like it becomes a little unbounded or yeah. arbitrarily bounded, so we want to have some more rules around it. So, Yes. Yeah, it's just, it's because we're pushovers. <laughs> well, there's also, there's also some concern about, if, like, the question is about do you pair the schmoozers and the students together? We do a, a meetup so the schmoozers can meet the students. Um, there's some concern regarding, like, the anxiety and, and, you know, pairing up a college student with, like, an arbitrary I mean, our person students, on the internet that decide to sponsor a college they're student. They're emailing me um, going, what should I weird. wear? You know, I mean, it's 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 endearing and cute, and they're they are so excited to be here. Usually, one, um, one poor student showed up two weeks early. He did. He did. Um, he was in he, the Slack channel. He's like, "Where are we meeting?" We're like, "Well, we're meeting there in two weeks." He's like, "Oh right. shit!" When I said Friday, <laughs> um, but Dalton. I mean, going back to Dalton. Dalton was one of our original Schmooze students. Um, he sent me a picture of him riding the Nittany Lion. At mostly the, clothes. Mostly clothes. He was shirtless, I believe. Yes. Paint me like one of your French girls yeah. on top of the the, the oh, just a small line shirt, wearing a woman's said. small shirt. It was really. I still hired him after that, which is really yeah. strange. Um. So any uh, There's a yes, question sir. over there. How do you go about sponsoring Schmoocon? So. <laughs> oh, I was sponsoring a student. Um, well, you wait until I, you know, update the website and you see that it's there and then you send an email answering some questions. I oh, will tweet it. I mean, just watch the Twitters. Watch. There's a section under tickets, I think, called Schmooze a Student is where that is. So um, it will stay unupdated for many months now and then it will be updated again. Right there. Why? Okay, so the question is why was I asking for people to send me their res IDs if they were outside of the block? More than any other year. Um, 
mostly, so the way that works, when you make a commitment with a hotel, um, sometimes you pay for space, sometimes you don't. We do not pay for this space. But the way I get around that is we have a room commitment with the hotel. Usually we make that commitment. You have to make 80% of your commitment generally is how these contracts work. I'll stop in a second, Andrea, I promise. Um, the, uh, you have to make 80% of your commitment. This year, we were a little, just a little bit behind on that, in part, I think, because of the pending government shutdowns. Um, you know, there's some variables, and so it's important to me that we show the hotel that we're here. I knew we were here, but if you're outside of the block, we don't get, they don't know that, right? So the other, the other um, benefit to us by having those numbers as high as possible is that one of the kickbacks that we get for hosting is that for every so many room nights booked at the hotel, we get a free night, and those nights help me pay for my staff rooms. So, so and, and I will say, since other conferences, they know who you are, and they can reconcile with the hotel, like here's our attendee list, and here are people that, that are there. We, we don't do that, right? We don't care who you are, but that makes it harder for us to prove like our commitment on the room block. So the hotel has been very good about rolling with us, because technically they have like a cutoff date two or three weeks ahead of time, says you have to meet your commitment by then. With us, they're like, just as long as you make your commitment by the time everyone checks in, like we're totally okay. So we, we've never like been penalized. Really but say that, but they've been very kind about it. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And again, so it's a cost benefit for us if we know that you're here but not in the block. Just it helps us, you know, pay for rooms and that kind of thing. Um, again, if there's anything else you'd like to see in Own the Con, do email us. I believe this is the last slide. You can send suggestions to this email. You can email me. You can email info. We get them all. Yes. Um, we read them all. We mostly respond to them all. And real quick on feedback, we owe a bunch of people who submitted talks feedback. Normally, we're a little more on top of that. Um, we had a bunch of issues pop over, personal issues pop up over Christmas this year, so we are behind. But once we wrap up the con this year, Bruce and I will get on that feedback process. Did you have running water over Christmas? Because we, we didn't. didn't. Um, or power for a little while, yeah. or you know, just a bunch of things. At anyway. It was a fun time. Anything else? What do the badges actually do? Oh, sir. The, ba the badges are a uh, signal strength. Uh, by default, they tell you the signal strength of the Shmukon WPA network. So if you're close to an a AP, it'll be green and then yellow and red and then not there. Um, and then um, you, apparently you can obviously flash them. If you go down to labs, they actually have, a, they'll reflash them and turn it into a uh, war walking contest where it looks for new SSIDs. And as it finds them, when it comes back here to the con, it will report up to a website. And if you found SSIDs nobody else has found, then you get points for them. So you can go walk around DC this and collect was an these ad hoc things. Thing it was like a you know, Pokemon war driving contest with a badge thing. So it was pretty, pretty cool. We didn't organize it, they just wrote the code. It was, it was pretty neat. So anyway, thank you very much. Everybody.
This is the fun part. I can't actually uh, control it. Good teamwork right there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, we're just waiting on. Do you need to go wake him up? No, uh, apparently he's he has risen. He has awoken. So. So, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> so, um, you guys presented before? We have, but okay. not here. So, you see the people behind the white, light, and blue shirts? Yep. Um, they will hold up a sign <coughs> when it's like 10 minutes to go. Okay. Saying, hey, you have a 10-minute warning, a 5-minute warning. And then they have a sign that is SDFU, get off the stage. Oh, okay. So, at the 15-minute you know, mark, that's the, they'll say, okay, you're done now. Okay. Because we need to... Uh, break down the room and get prepared for the uh, our closing preliminary yeah. debates. So we have about 40 minutes to ramble? Yep, a full 50 minutes. 50 However hours. you choose to okay. intersperse questions or whatnot. Okay. Um, the only other part that we ask is when you get questions, you feed them on the microphone. Okay. Yeah. Um, even if like they're loud in the audience, because of the internet streaming, we want to make sure that people in the audience can yep. hear it. Yep, understood. Sure. So, do you guys have everything you need? Uh, I think so. Uh, up, yeah. Sure. We're good. Yeah. Don't need these. Well, I don't know. That light. You might want the... Yeah. Yeah. No guarantees. You guys got the cheap seats. You don't get the good talk. <laughs> the really bad talks, actually, that start. Uh, do we do we take these out or um, how do we do? So we they, yell. So the, yeah, that mic is there. These, okay. if you want to to wander, these have a little bit of movement, but they're they're both live. Okay. Uh, they don't move a lot. So if you really want to want to stand and talk, your best bet is to stand over there. Okay. Okay. But however you guys want to do it, as long as you're on mic such that people can hear you. Well, why don't we use this one as the backup? Yeah. So you can over at yeah. the other we'll back and forth as we. Uh, Did we get them in Canadian? Yeah. Don't worry, we had the we had the hinges oiled, so we're yeah, good. Yeah, it'll we're be good. less squeaky, don't worry. Yeah, it's not gonna be a lot of squawking. Come on, turrets. It's a shame that these don't have.
Obviously, you wouldn't want to buy this talk. No. 